Make sure you guys hit the subscribe button if you guys are enjoying the content that we're throwing up. And uh, make sure you guys hit the like button if you enjoy the video. And yeah, let's begin. What's going on, guys? This is Rob, and we are getting back into Marvel Zombies Resurrection. Yes, we are on issue number two. Now, uh, before we start this video, myself and Mariah are going to be live streaming on twitch.tv slash eat codes at 6.30 p.m. tonight, which is October October 1st, Thursday. This is Thursday. Uh, we're going to be live streaming at 6.30 p.m. We're going to be playing Fall Guys, and we're going to be doing drinking games. So basically, we're going to get drunk over the course of our stream. <laughs> So, uh, make sure you guys come out and hang out with us while we just kind of get progressively less sober. <laughs> but what we end up doing here is we kind of pick up before the events of the main story taking place, right? We basically get a bit of a flashback here. And the idea is that when the initial outbreak first happened, Peter Parker is Spider-Man and so on and so forth. He's immediately attacked by basically the Fantastic Four, Reed Richards, Ben Grimm, Johnny Storm, and Susan Storm. And they end up kind of grabbing Franklin and Valeria. And the whole reason behind this is that where they arrive here, of course, it's their kids. And they kind of say that like in our previous life they were our family but we have a new family now and these kids are going to join us in this new family and so you basically end up having peter of course begging for them you know begging for the fantastic four to leave the kids alone but ultimately susan storm ends up biting franklin richards and so what this points to is the idea that franklin is infected right that's basically what it looks like it's it's kind of nuts here one of the other big questions that sort of has to be asked is why franklin richards hair is dark at this point in time and now it's blonde we can kind of assume that it was basically dyed and he's gone back to his natural hair color you know, over this this time period. But you end up basically having this, this scenario where you kind of wake up with Peter in the present moment and they're basically heading towards the phalanx wall. Now, the explanation of this is essentially given to us by Blade. And let's be honest with ourselves, the only reason Blade's in this story is because of the fact that he's getting a movie. <laughs> if it wasn't for that, we probably wouldn't see him in here, which may be one of the reasons why it took so long for the story to come out is that once Blade was announced for the MCU, Marvel basically had to go back and just rewrite the whole story to put Blade in it. But the idea is that Blade basically says that initially what humanity did is they created machines right robots you know artificial intelligence organisms they were kind of created by a coalition between shield and advanced idea mechanics to fight the dead when they first showed up here because machines cannot be consumed by the virus but what ended up happening is that despite their best efforts the various you know marvel zombies ended up pushing humanity to the brink of almost near extinction and so because there aren't really any more humans running the show here the machines have kind of become their own self-governing entity their own self-governing society and they basically fight against the zombies to control the world is really what what you know kind of a, a subplot that seems to be going on here and so when the questions asked why blades even part of this in the first place he's like because i just kill the undead right i don't really care about you or franklin or valeria or anything like that you guys are a means to an end right you guys can help me get from one location to the next but understand if you die it's not the biggest thing to me but while they're traveling they're suddenly set upon by marvel zombies right like the eradicator from alpha flight and i'd like to point out here this is probably the most useful alpha flights ever been in the history of their publications when they're zombies and they attack like Peter Parker and everybody else and they do what Alpha Flight does which is die uh so these guys are basically destroyed <laughs> because Alpha Flight sucks and uh and this this basically leads to them of course kind of crashing down so on and so forth and immediately set upon by like a whole host of zombies but in the middle of all this they're met by the arrival of a Nimrod right like a Nimrod Sentinel now here's the funny thing about this and something that I'm not overly fond of here this Nimrod Sentinel is basically just an agent of the machine coalition right the the machine group right these these robots that are kind of out here nimrod here's here's, a, here's an important thing to understand with why i view this right long before hickman started writing x-men nimrod has historically been kind of like the one-two punch of the sentinel program you know he came from days of future past right in days of future past the machine or the the sentinel program was jump-started after the assassination of senators robert or senator robert kelly and charles xavier of the x-men and maura mctaggart but the sentinels ended up coming to the realization that if humanity tasked them with tracking down and elim eliminating mutants that much like what you saw in X-Men the Animated Series, that mutants are the next level of human evolution. And at their base level, mutants are human. And so in turn, they turned on the entirety of humanity. But in their in the in the process of doing that, the Sentinels were constantly trying to find a way to better themselves. And the the you know this this basically kind of coalesced in the creation of the Nimrod Sentinel that had the ability to like analyze a mutant, understand their powers, and basically find uh, find ways to counter those powers. And so it was really just like a super powerful being, right? Here, he's just a guy that's there and is a attacking the various Marvel zombies. Now, but you basically end up having Nana, the Sentinel, who kind of attacks the Marvel zombies, and, and it's really just kind of, you know, these robots sort of locking everybody down, 
right? Like the other part of the other thing that kind of comes out of this is you've got Viv, the daughter of Vision, who's kind of running, you know, seems to be the one running this show. You've got a Doombot, but you've also got Frank Castle, who's basically a robot as well. And we get this sort of explanation, you know, once they're all taken and they start talking to Viv, that one, Viv isn't really who she used to be, right? She's not as kind of outgoing and, and, and great as she used to be. Instead, you know, her components have kind of been replaced over the years. And so while she hasn't totally lost herself, she's really more enveloped in the realm of being a machine than she is being more human, right? So she's kind of to a degree lost that human element. Vivian is socially awkward. <laughs> <laughs> is essentially what's kind of going on here. The other part of this is that the last time Valeria saw Vivian, it was actually her and Miles Morales who were traveling to an outbreak zone right in Hell's Kitchen. But Miles Morales didn't survive. And that was kind of what led to Vivian sort of losing her humanity, was looking around and realizing how many people she cared about were being killed off and that there's strength in being a robot that can't really be converted. The other thing that had gone on here is that with Frank Castle, the reason why he looks the way he does is that being human, being organic, makes you susceptible to the virus. And so he had willingly undergone exposure to the trans mode virus, which basically has converted him into a cybernetic organism. And so essentially he's really more machine than man, twisted and evil an agent of the dark side now. <laughs> but that's basically what he is. He's basically kind of a, a walking, talking cyborg, you know, and he chose that path. And so while they're all kind of taken to what they believe to be is going to be, you know, more or less a safe haven, they end up finding out they're being taken to a location where the trans mode virus is going to run its course and they're going to be converted into a machine. Now, initially there's, there's an attempt by Valeria to appeal to, to Vivian, but Vivian doesn't really hear it. She's like, you know, we're going to make you stronger, right? We're going to make you better. We're going to basically get rid of any toxicity you have in your system. And then we're going to, then we're going to fix you, right? We're going to turn you into what basically what Frank Castle is. The other thing, and, and it's really kind of an easy thing to notice here. The other thing is they talk about Franklin, right? They say, what about the boy? He's unaware of his nature, right? But he would be a great value against the respawn. And this is kind of important here because it looks like Franklin's powers are more or less gone. But what this seems to point out is that his powers are not gone, that his powers are very much intact. And this would easily explain why it is that while being attacked here, that he's not somebody who turned, right? He didn't turn into one of the zombies, that he's still very much alive. And so from there, you kind of have this discussion about the nature of the of these these respawn, right? These Marvel zombies. And what we kind of get here is this full-on explanation of what they are. The funny thing is that in the main Marvel zombies story that was written by Robert Kirkman back in the day, that until you got to the, the tie-in involving the evil dead, there wasn't really any explanation of how the Marvel zombies worked outside of their zombies. And that's basically it, right? It was a dark humor story. And you just kind of went on existing knowledge about zombies and went forward from there, right? It wasn't really a comic that was meant to be taken super seriously. With this one, it looks like Marvel's kind of following the standard fare of like offering an explanation and basically saying that it's not really them being undead in the traditional sense, that what it is, is it's a kind of submicrobial parasitic organism that shares a collective consciousness. And that when a person is bitten or infected, they're infected with this microbial organism and that basically kills the body. And then in turn kind of takes it over and brings it into part of the hive mind. And so she basically says like, there is no cure here. And it doesn't necessarily seem to be true, right? If the microbial organism kills the body, then I guess, yes, there is no cure insofar as those individuals who have been infected can actually be saved. Uh, instead, you'd have to kill the microbial organism, which in turn means the body would just shut back down again, right? So that would basically be it. Uh, and so it's like killing the brain and just nothing else can follow, right? The body just can't function after that. So so there is no cure insofar as like, hey, we can save everybody out there and make them back the way they were. But there is a cure in the sense that you can kill the organism and basically wipe out all the zombies. The problem with this is that there's this massive explosion or massive, you know, booming that kind of takes place outside the building and it's kind of like you know like what is that right like that felt close you know can something actually bring this down and the, the response of Vivian is like nothing out there can bring this down short of any attack from like a Hulk and that's exactly what it is it's not just a Hulk it's the Hulk family man it's the Incredible Hulk it's She-Hulk it is uh Scar the son of the Hulk and it's the Red Hulk on top of that it's Ben Grimm the thing it's Gladiator and Hyperion like it's the big heavy hitters of like the Marvel universe coming down here to just rain down hellfire, death and destruction, right? It's judgment day in this facility. <laughs> because literally they just start ripping all the robots to pieces, right? Just like tearing all these guys apart. And so at that point, Vivian's just like, run. That's all we can do here is just run. That's the best we can do. It's just flee for our lives, right? Like just get out of here as fast as we can. The other part of this is that the Nana Sentinel, Vivian basically says that they were essentially running a program, running a subroutine that would kind of cleanse her programming as it was done by Peter Parker and then kind of turn her back into the way she is or the way she's supposed to be as far as like an agent of the, of the machine group. The problem is that the program hasn't really had a chance to run its course. And so she's kind of stuck in that space in between. And so you end up basically having Nana showing up and kind of saving the day to a degree and basically grabbing, you know, everybody jumping on board and then her flying off. The problem with this is that
that the Incredible Hulk jumps after them. And as you guys know, the Incredible Hulk can jump fast and far because of his leg strength, right? Because of just the over overwhelming amount of strength he has. And Vivian asked the question of Peter Parker, why are you really going after Galactus, right? Like, what's the point of this? And Peter initially responds and saying, like, I told you it's because of the kids. And she says, no, why are you going, right? Like, why are you doing this? Why are you bringing the kids there? And Peter says, because he wants to believe in something again. Peter feels hopeless. He feels hopeless in all of this. He feels hopeless because, you know, he's the reason Franklin got infected. He feels hopeless because the entire superhero, uh, superhero community fell and there was nothing he could really do. But I would say there's a bigger guilt going on here than that. I would say that there came a point in this battle when Peter realized he couldn't win and fled. Fear got the better of him and he ran away and left people to die, right? I would say that's probably what really happened here. But with Vivian getting that response from Peter, she basically says, fine, then like do whatever you need to do, find something to believe in. And she sacrifices herself to the Incredible Hulk, right? She goes to attack him and basically knock him to the ground. Vivian, as we know, is probably going to die. And so what you end up getting here is it looks like this moment when Peter kind of seems to entertain this idea of reactivating Franklin's powers, right? Of like turning Franklin's powers back on. We're not really given a definitive explanation if that's the case, but you end up having, you know, Valeria who's kind of using this, this radiation detector to locate Galactus' signal and starts to realize like we're getting closer as they're flying. And what it seems like is they're out in the middle of nowhere, right? They're literally out in the middle of the ocean. And when the question is asked by Peter, like it doesn't really make any sense. Like we're out here in the middle of nowhere. The Galactus hive always went for population centers. Why would we be here? The response of Valeria is, can you not think of a population center in the Atlantic Ocean? And she's like, we're headed for the Atlantis colony. We're headed for what would be the kingdom of Namor the Submariner. With that being said, guys, we're gonna bring this video to an end. If you are new here to Comments Explained, make sure you guys hit the sub button to become part of the Rob Corps. If you guys enjoyed this video, make sure you drop a like and I will catch you all later. Peace.